Ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon. I'm Georgi Chaltikan, Professor and Head of Digital Health at Degendorf Institute of Technology in Germany. It's my absolute pleasure to, to, uh, to try my best to moderate this interesting panel this afternoon titled Diversity, Equity and Inclusion in uh, uh, Data. And thank you all for uh, joining us uh, here. Thank you to our audience. And of course, it is also my pleasure to thank the organizers of MedTech uh, World for inviting me to moderate this panel. Well, there is no doubt that uh, a successful implementation of digital health and achieving the full potential of the, uh, the full transformative power of digital health uh, will essentially be dependent on our ability to harness uh, the power of uh, digital health data for both primary use and especially for the secondary use. We desperately need high quality data. We've been hearing about that this afternoon and elsewhere and before um, to, for, to allow the biggest promise of digital health, the AI, ML, to develop, thrive and to really start making real difference in real world. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, not only the availability and quality of data uh, remains a challenge, there are also risks related to our ability to ensure an equitable and ethical use of data uh, and to make sure not leave behind any potentially vulnerable population group um, as both the source, I should say, and also the target, the users of data and thus avoiding various forms of data bias and digital divide. We've already spoken quite, uh, uh, quite a lot about bias. So these are some of the points that we will be addressing in this panel. And I'm extremely honored to be joined by our wonderful panelists. Um, Hosna Salmani, welcome. Hosna. Mary Akangbem, um, Olabimeji Vumim, Brian Ogden, and Vincenzo Variale. Now I'm going to ask uh, our panelists uh, each to um, tell us in few words about basically to introduce yourselves and to tell us in about two minutes what are you mostly, what, what is the most important area of your practice and what is your passion in relation to the field. Shall we start with Mary, with you probably? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Mary Akongbe. Um, my background is minimally invasive surgery, robotics, and genomics. I'm the founder of Zenith Global Health. And because of my work in the innovative area um, in health, I've met lots of amazing people doing things across the world, especially um, EMEA. So my passion is to bridge that gap between the global south, global north, so that we can provide health equity, tech equity, and especially sustenance. And especially now that we are moving from clinical practice to um, digital health, telemedicine, how do we get the right things to the right people and involve the right people, which I think we'll be sharing more about in diversity, equity, and inclusion in data. Thank you very much. Hasna. Yes, in the name of God, uh, hello, good afternoon. My name is Hosna Salmani from Iran University of Medical Sciences. Uh, I'm a PhD student in health information technology at Iran University of Medical Sciences, and I'm passionate about the intersection of health and technology, and I use my skills to develop an application uh, for uh, cancer patients. Uh, and uh, I also won prestigious awards uh, from uh, several uh, institutions like National Light Foundation uh, and the Youth Tech Health from USA uh, that, is, uh, um, that is sponsored by UNESCO. And also I'm a reviewer for HIMSS 23, which will be held in USA. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ola Dimeji, would you like to go next? My name is Ola Dimeji Hewumi. So I'm a freelance health writer, medical artificial intelligence thought leader, and a trained biochemist. So I help healthcare brands, life science brands, biopharma, and medtech with their content marketing strategy. And I'm most passionate about seeing how our AI can actually advance a patient care. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. 
Vincenzo? Uh, my name is Vincenzo Variale. Um, I'm a psychologist with a doctorate in, psych in psychophysiology. Uh, I'm also a co-owner and co-founder of a, a startup, Equilibrium Health Limited. Uh, we create uh, tools uh, uh, to help uh, to track um, uh, cognitive decline in elders and to help them to uh, stay uh, cognitively healthy uh, as long as possible. I'm very passionate of uh, melting my passion, which is neurosciences with technology and the creation of new uh, innovative tools to help more people, elders people mainly. Thank you so much. Brian, tell us a little bit what you do and what, I, what your I'm Brian is. Ogden. I am the founder of Ninja Mobile, which is an international, um, it's growing into an international consortium to reconcile different kinds of data uh, through the use of conversational AI. There was two pilots and they went to the same school and they broke off. One went into the mil military and the other one went into being a commercial pilot. And the, the, the pilot was flying from Belgium to the Netherlands and this guy, this jet flyer flew, fighter flew right up next to the commercial flight. And, um, and he said, hey buddy, remember me? From pilot school? He said, yeah. He goes, watch this. So he did some loop-de-loops, and he dro drove that plane right down to the ground, and he did a hammerhead stall, and he, he did all this military action, and he said, hi, what do you think of that? And the, the commercial pilot said, all right, all right, I'll show you something. And the plane continued on this, this Boeing 747 at 700 kph for about 15 minutes in a straight line. And then the pilot came on and says, what do you think of that? He goes, what do you mean, what do you think of that? What would you do? Well, I went back to the wash, wash room and I got me a cup of coffee and I talked to that cute new stewardess and I, I got a, a, a croissant. So that's, that's what is important in inclusion and diversity and data. You can do all kinds of loop-to-loops. There's all kinds of things you can do with AI. But really, what do you want to do and what's feasible? What autopilot are we going to use with our data? And, and that's our work. Thank you, Brian. So before we proceed further, I would like to say that we'd like to make this panel um, very interactive as much as we can. So um, we'd be happy to, to, to take also questions from the audience. Just let me know whenever you have a question. And a uh, very quick introduction, who are you, what you do, and who the question is is actually addressed. Or it, if if any panelist could answer, that's fine as well. So, Brian, um, talking about equity, yeah, I'd, I'd, like, I'd, I'd ask you to uh, dive deep in and directly into the topic. Well, we're I, speaking you know, about we're, equity. I appreciate, now. Yeah. I appreciate that. I, to go right for the quick, um, I have a controversial view about open data. So, just to be frank, I'm not clear that everyone can leverage open data for its usefulness. You have to be capitalized to make any sense of data and to put it through the analytics and to deploy it in an appropriate way. So to have diversity and equity and inclusion in data, we need, we need governance, we need, um, we need uh, uh, really, I, don't, I, I mean, intervention into this space so that the large, already capitalized um, businesses don't just scoop up all the open data <laughs> Um, and that the, that the SDGs can be fulfilled and that the little guys can get their access that they need in order to deploy. So it's important, I think, in my humble opinion, to do some kind of model like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Unity, it's a gaming platform. And they allow uh, free access to this amazing billion dollar um, application that's gone through an IPO, free, until you reach a certain um, level of income. And then you have to pay. So if you're a big guy, you need to pay. And that, th that seems to go along with EU um, uh, policy that, you know, polluter pays. If you, if you need to make an access of the data, you can leverage that. Then you should be able to contribute, especially with public data. So in, the, in terms of public data, that, the, the monetization of that data should be returned to the citizens to a certain extent in my humble opinion. A good point, monetization. Uh, but uh, Mary, 
we have a very significant imbalance, let's say, in, uh, in the, even in the quantity of data, let's say, between uh, global north and global south. Let's put it that way, right? So it's already, I mean, we, we look at the, uh, this heat map of where, what, what data the algorithms are based off, and we see, let's say, 40, 50% of that coming from North America, probably 30% from Europe, and maybe just, you know, a few percent coming from elsewhere in the world, right? In, in from, from many countries in Africa, um, Asia, also Latin America. So what, how can we correct that, actually? What, should, what can be done to, uh, to provide more data coming from basically places other than US and Europe, let's put it that way, and a few, you know, a fistful of countries in, in, uh, in, uh, in the Middle East or in, uh, uh, in, in Asia. What do you think? Is there, is there anything we can do? Because yeah. we know there's a lot of inequity to begin yes. with, right? There's, there's huge inequities in the economy, there's inequities in healthcare per se. So is it possible for us to speak of equity in, with, with regards to data? Yes. What do you think? Yeah, it is possible. And my take is that we go back to basics. Because we have this inequality existing already in clinical practice. We didn't fix it. We moved on to digital health, to AI and things like that. And now we are faced with the same problems. So what do we do? We start with clinical trials. Um, recently, Lancet published something that if there's any collaboration between um, UK, US, and any EMA, they need to specify the person involved, the number of data, the quality of data, before they will accept it for publication. And I think that's a good step forward. The other thing is, there was a study into diabetes, which we know it's largely, uh, people who are largely affected are uh, black ethnic minority, and this was even in the UK, only one third can specify that included language in the clinical trials. So we have to look at communication. We have to look at um, finances, of course, because the interpretation of the uh, components or uh, things that we're going to use is important. The other thing is, when we talk about data, we're talking about um, digital medicine, health technology we have to lower the bar to come to these people's level, people we want to include in the data. How literacy are they in health tech or even basic um, computer? We have to take that into cognizance. Then we can get more on board. We need to work on trust. I mean, there's a lot that we have to do. And it will probably take us back a year or two, but we've got to fix it. Because before we can get to a state of health equity, tech equity, and doing the best for, you know, global good. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Mary. We basically, we're moving now, or we, we've touched a little bit on this, you know, in this area of digital divide. We'll, we'll come back to it. But before that, I wanted to um, ask a question, Hosna. Uh, what do you think, do we need more legislative efforts? Do we need a little bit more, Brian was speaking of governance. Do we need more regulation? Do we need more efforts to ensure equity, diversity, and inclusion? Or you think it's rather culture change? Do you think it's gonna take us time? Or, or can we do something now or in the next years? As, uh, yes, uh, as we know today, everything is about data. Uh, we should focus on data and uh, we need to integrate data and we see and the integrate platform and that data can exchange, can have shared between patient and provider. So if, for example, we have this type of data, uh, we can see many institutions, university, hospital, everywhere, we can have access uh, to these data and uh, they can use everywhere and every time that they need this. And also for this pass, we should have a data governance strategy and we should focus on the e-health strategy to see in the past and the future. And when, for example, regulate the e-health technology, that nowadays patient-centered technology is very 
um, well known and uh, usually um, the uh, researchers uh, focus on this type of uh, technology. So if we can have a, a patient monitoring data, uh, we should, uh, we need to have the uh, focus on the quality of this data and it's very important to see the path that uh, we follow and also we, uh, in the, behind this we should see the uh, expenses and uh, cost benefit of this technology that can, for example, collect and uh, share and also uh, we have an exchange between the companies. And we can also follow a four, um, four uh, board for this acquisition of data and access of data and also uh, we should have a integration and actionable insight for this to see which te technology can suitable for this uh, for our goal in organization thank you thank you very much uh, Vincenzo, how would you uh, describe let's say working with um, uh, um, the elderly people with um, uh, uh, cognitive dysfunctions now there is I believe a specific, also a very significant potential, right, with regard to equity and uh, um, leaving basically uh, some people uh, um, beyond that digital divide. How do you, how do you addressing that? What is basically what do we do to um, make sure that the people who need these uh, these algorithms, the people who need digital health the most frequently are those who are at risk of not being included, right? How would you, what is your take on that? Thank you uh, for the question, Prof. And uh, uh, well, uh, we are working on this since uh, um, a bit of time, actually. And yes, there is a digital divide and uh, um, elders are less prone to use, uh, uh, um, to use technology to, uh, uh, for their health. Yes, this is true, but it's also true, in my opinion, that, uh, 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 for example, tablets, smartphones, this kind of very pervasive uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, digital devices, they are digital devices, actually, uh, are becoming more and more, uh, more and more diffused everywhere, also in, uh, in elders. Um, I know many, many elders who are using that kind of interaction. Of course, um, uh, when you work with them, uh, you have to uh, 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 create an environment uh, which is uh, 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 adapted to uh, uh, the exigence of, uh, of these, these people. Um, the, the kind of interaction, the kind of interface, of course, but after all, uh, um, um, they are using more and more this kind of technique. That, I think that uh, this, uh, using this, uh, the, these devices can be a channel to reach, to outreach them, which are usually excluded, as you say it, uh, excluded from digital health while they uh, are, uh, con should be the one of the first consumers, actually. Um, so yes, um, and then uh, I believe that uh, dig the, the digital is all around, all around them, so uh, they use the digital every time, they, they do anything at the moment. So uh, uh, I believe that this gap is going to reduce in the next years. We just need to prepare for this. We just need to prepare for this. I will be 16, 20 years, and I will use, still use a tablet if they will still exist, of course. I will still use. Then there are new technologies like uh, 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 virtual reality, for example, uh, or augmented reality, for example, which are even more immediate. Another thing is the kind of interaction between the application and the patient or the user, which should be as much as simplified as possible, even passive, is po if possible. I think, yes, in indeed. The, the, uh, thank you very much for that point. And I, I think we all understand the importance of, um, well, the human computer interface, right? The, the um, uh, user experience and uh, user interface for making, for, for, for the technology to really enjoy adoption across the, across the different population groups. However, 
um, are we going to, well, Adimeji, what do you think? Are we going to have sort of a generational gap forever or not? Because my, the, the question is coming from understanding, let's say you mentioned tablets. All right. We uh, are not native to tablets, so to say, right? Our generation. Now our children are native. So, so, so well, we, we, they're digital, digital native, right? However, there will, there will always be coming up a technology that our children will be less used than their children, and their children will be less used than their children, right? So is it, is it going be um, uh, um, is it going to be a challenge in the next decades? Or alternatively, maybe it's going to be developing so fast because we know that it's exponential now that it w that, that the same generation will be facing challenges, you know, adopting all that technology. What do you think? In terms of our adopting technologies, I think that our, there won't be so much uh, of a divide. Yeah, because our research suggests that you have so many our, our aging populations now interested in utilizing a number of our social robots and AI and all of that. So, and in a way, it has actually bridged the gap. It has actually helped bridge our, the divide in healthcare. And even there are lots of our aging populations now who are also into telehealth medicines. Some wouldn't even, some, some people use uh, the, the, the Fitbit technology and Apple or smartphones and all that. And our, I think our, because these interfaces are, uh, have come up in a way that is actually consumer friendly and consumer readable. So it's easy for people of all, or like, of older, or um, I mean, the aging populations to actually read, or even have a child put them through on how to actually use this. So I really think that it's the divide is not going to be so much of that. Okay, thank you for that. Do yeah. we have any questions from the audience in the meantime? Please let us know, if any. Um, Brian, we are going to have this uh, huge amount of patient, well, we used to call them, to call it patient-generated health data. Now it's rather person-generated health data. And speaking about commercialization, now all these sensors right now, are they available to everyone? Is there any potential for uh, inequality or inequity with the just with the, the mere availability of those all those sensor devices how how is that going to change do what do what do you think what what do we need for that do we need to pay do the health systems need to pay for that uh, is it about reimbursement is it about uh, is it is it more commerce then how do you make sure that everybody and the people are not underrepresented I think in the um, in the global south we have a you know a, a pretty serious issue or technology gap, and that, that's what we want to address. I think all of the panelists would agree that we want to include um, those who cannot pay uh, at this time, and we want to provide equity to everyone. That that really analysis, the fruit of analysis, and the fruit of human intelligence should be available almost as a right. Is data a right, you guys? Do you think data is a right? Yeah, and I think that's why um, we have to be talking to each other, private, public, lawmakers, decision makers, strategic um, stakeholders, consumers. We all have to be talking to each other so that if there is enough financial sources or resources and human resources, then we'll be able to reach out to everybody, including making things that are um, products that are feasible and user-friendly from age to gender to um, other ethical um, minorities and also to consider the ethical implications of data like consent, you mentioned governance, litigation, one has happened, more is coming. Um, yeah, so we need to be talking to each other in that sphere. Absolutely, yeah. We're unfortunately running short of time, but uh, what came to my mind actually, do you remember how we tried to approach vaccines, COVID vaccines, right? Did we succeed there? 
I would be kind of a little bit doubtful. How many of you, ladies and gentlemen, in the audience, think that this paradigm, this vision that data is right, will be fulfilled in the next 10 years? How many of you think that it will not? Thank you very much. On that, I think, I think we're going to conclude our panel. And uh, I think we owe a, a big round of applause to our wonderful panelists. And thank you very much.